Okay, so this video, I want to cover off just a few of the basic parts of web scraping, what you need to learn to get started, some of the technology, some of the languages, and some different methods to get you going on your way to hopefully stop you wasting time or maybe trying to pursue something that isn't the best fit for your, what you're trying to achieve. So I generally use Python for web scraping. It's the language that I know the best. Uh, you don't need to be an expert though. You just need to have a good grip on some of the core principles like the variables, loops, data types like dictionaries and lists. And also if you understand how a network, network HTTP requests work like get and post, that will also help a lot. Today's video is sponsored by Oxylabs, a provider of proxies and web scraping services. Their proxy pool has over 100 million IPs in 195 countries, and they serve a thousand plus clients worldwide, so you know that the proxies you're gonna be getting are top quality. As someone who does a lot of web scraping, I can say that proxies are a must if you're trying to scrape at scale, and without them, you will struggle to get the data that you need. My personal pick would be the residential proxies, as unlike the data center proxies, these have all been assigned to by an internet service provider, meaning that they'll look just like you or I are browsing the web page. And if you use the residential proxies, you're gonna get zero captures and no IP blocking, so you can just concentrate on getting the data that you want. Check out their proxy offers using the link in the description below. Oxylabs also has three API scraping services that you can use for all sorts of applications, including search engines, or the one that I like the most, which is the dedicated e-commerce product scraper. You can use this to get product data, so you can do price monitoring and competitor analysis. In fact, the scraper APIs actually have a free trial going on at the moment, so check them out using the link in the description below. And on top of that, Oxylabs are also offering you 15% off with my code JR15. So click that link in the description below and use my promo code JR15 for 15% off. So in my opinion, there are three main parts to a successful web scraper. The first one involves actually making the request to the server somehow. You need to actually ask for that data so you can then do, take it and do something with it. Now this comes up in many different ways and guises, but generally speaking, you have to have some kind of request first to ask for that information. The second part is to actually do something with that information to pass it. So maybe you have a load of HTML that you've got back that you need to then pass through and pull the data out that you're after, or maybe you've got a whole load of JSON data and you just need certain parts of it. But the second part is definitely just doing something with that data that you've got. The third part is actually taking that data that you've transformed, that you've passed into something, and then outputting it somewhere. Maybe you want to save it into a database, or maybe even as simply as just exporting it to CSV so you can analyze it, or maybe you want to share it with some other people. So those are the three main steps you need to keep in mind to sort of like make yourself a successful web scraping program. So to follow on from the three main steps, there are also three main methods of scraping data from a site. So the first one is possibly the most simple but and also the most basic and still works in a lot of cases. You'll be surprised how often you'll find sites that are basically just still HTML that you can actually request from the server and pass out the HTML data to get the information that you need. Even though JavaScript is really common on the web, a lot of sites still use static HTML for good reason. So if you come across a site that you wanna get the data from and this available data is in the HTML, then go ahead and use something like Requests in Beautiful Soup just to get that information and pass the HTML data. The second most common method is by actually rendering out that JavaScript in some way, shape or form. So you will always find that JavaScript websites will load content dynamically, which means you can't actually access the, the data from the HTML because it doesn't actually exist until something has happened with the browser. JavaScript works by listening to events and loading that content into that page dynamically. If you use the first method, you're not gonna get the data that you want because that data isn't actually there at the time that you're requesting it. I've talked about this before in various rendering methods. My favorite one probably at the moment is to use something like Puppeteer in Node or maybe request HTML in Python. This controls a lightweight Chrome browser in the background that will actually just open up for you and render the JavaScript and then send you the data back for you to pass. Now this does have its drawbacks, it is a bit slower, but it is a good option for certain sites that you need to do this for. 
The third method, which is definitely my preferred way to do this, is to actually look behind the site and actually find where that information is coming from. So modern websites work with a back end and a front end, and the front end will request the data from the back end to display the user. So you gotta think about these load more buttons or infinite scroll. So when you trigger that, that's the event that JavaScript's waiting for, it will actually send a request via Ajax to the server and ask for that data back. Now, in most cases, that request we can actually see in the network tab of our developer tools on our browser, and we can see the endpoint it's making the request to, and we can mimic it. Now, the great thing about these requests, this hidden API, is the fact that the data almost always comes back in JSON, which is great for us because the actual, we get all of the information we could have wanted, all neatly, nicely structured. And the benefit also is that we're not wasting loads of server data by making loads of requests for information we're never going to do anything with. This is definitely my preferred way of web scraping, and you just need to have a poke around on the website first to see if the actual uh, endpoints for the API are available that you can use. Now, it isn't always quite as simple as that because quite often you'll need to send over the headers and the cookies as well because you need to convince the server that you are actually a browser. The best way to do this is to find one of these requests in your developer tools, copy it as curl, and then use something like Postman or Insomnia to then work with that request, see which headers you do and don't need, and then change it to see if you get more data in less requests. So to carry on with our three main methods, we have three main tools available to us as Python web scrapers. The first one is your requests and beautiful soup for, which generally go together, request to get the data, BS4 to pass it, and I also put in request HTML in here as well, because it basically does the same thing. It's just an all-in-one package. I personally prefer it. It's uh, easier for me to just work with. I know you can use CSS selectors with Beautiful Soup 4, but they're just easier and native in request HTML. It's my preferred package in that respect. The second one we've got is Scrapey, which is a full web scraping framework. It's really powerful. It can do so many things. Everything's been thought of and it's just a great resource. The only issue is that it, it does have a slightly higher learning curve, but once you get there, you can do so much with Scrapey that you'll probably never look anywhere else. The third tool is some kind of browser automation like Selenium or Playwright, which I've been covering a lot recently. And this is sort of like a, a real niche use case, I suppose, where maybe you need to do something really specific with the browser just to get to the point where you can get the data out. Now it's worth noting that all of these tools that I've mentioned, you can combine together. So you don't need to use one or the other. You can use Scrapey to make the request and then pass the data with Beautiful Soup 4. You can also do the same with Playwright. I've done that before where you just use Playwright to make the request and get the HTML back and then pass it with BS4 or something similar. So don't feel like you can't mix and match because you absolutely can. Now, if Python's not your thing and you're more into Node, your options are Axios and Cheerio, which is for Axios is for making a request and Cheerio is for passing the DOM or the, or the HTML effectively. And you also have Puppeteer, which is Google's headless Chrome browser, which is really powerful for all sorts of browser automation, JavaScript rendering, and has loads of things going on. So if you're more of a JavaScript and Node person, you're gonna wanna look into Axios, Cheerio, and Puppeteer. To finish up, it wouldn't be fair to talk about some of the issues that you will face when you're trying to scrape data from a site. I've narrowed this down into, yep, you guessed it, three main issues. The first one, which I see a lot in beginners and hopefully will hopefully have addressed in this video somehow, is picking the right method. So if you're trying to render loads of JavaScript pages but you and you haven't actually looked to see if you can get that data from the backend API, you're gonna spend a lot of time and resources trying to make that work when there would be a much easier way. You really need to put a lot of time into investigating the site that you're trying to get data from to see what the best method or combination of methods is going to be to actually extract that data. The second one which ties in quite closely with the first is using the right tool. So as I said, don't try to use Playwright to do a load of in-depth complicated HTML passing where you can use something like BS4, which is gonna do it much quicker and much easier. The third one, which is obviously going to be the most complicated and difficult one, is avoiding blocking or being identified as a bot, captures and IP blocks and all of that stuff. 
Now, this is a really in-depth topic in, ex in itself, but my general rules are that if you're scraping at scale, you need a real proper solution involving proxies and or some kind of capture solving service. But if you're just doing it for personal data that you want to get out or maybe just to do some analytics on something, then I reckon then I would recommend just slowing your requests down, trying to act like more human and taking your time about getting that data out. Don't try and force through thousands of requests as quickly as you can because that's a quick way to upset the website owner and your IP is just going to get blocked straight away. So hopefully you guys have actually benefited from this in some way. I've tried to do as much of like a data brain dump as I could to sort of try and fill you in if you're new to web scraping or if you're learning to try and give you as much information as I can in this one video. Now I've covered almost all of these topics in their own videos in their own right. So if you've found any of this interesting, I definitely go ahead and check out my channel, check out my videos, and you'll find so much more interesting information on web scraping, how I do things, what results I get, how I overcome certain problems, all on there. So thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.